I'm Ruth. And I'm Brenton. Welcome to Spectrum Today. We've got mm -hmm. a great guest coming up in we a few do. moments. But first, we're going to take a little time for news. Okay. I always like to ask this question of Ruth, how was you know, the weekend? You know how my weekend was. We had a great weekend. We really did. When you yeah. ask me, I get it's like blank. I draw yeah. a blank as to what well, we did. I remember yesterday. Well, Saturday. Yesterday was part of the weekend. Yeah, I'm thinking about what we did Saturday. Well, yesterday I want to we were uh, at church. Talk about the weekend briefly. Okay. We have a new puppy. Oh yeah. Our puppy now. She's awesome. Is able to go out in public. Oh, that was the first she's time. Fully vaccinated. That's right. That so. is a weight. Have you ever gotten a new puppy? We haven't had a new puppy in so long. Those okay. She's 16 weeks now. Yeah. And Sweet so she baby. is now able to go to the dog park, and oh it was my. the funniest thing. We had. She's five pounds. She's barking at all of the other animals. They're huge animals, German Shepherds. She doesn't care who they are. She's because she knows. She she's like, what is this? I've never been here before, and meeting everybody. She's barely experienced other people. Right. Really, because you so have to keep them excited. so sequestered until they have all their little <laughs> vaccinations. She is so excited when people come to the house because she's like, wow, I didn't know more than four people existed, existed in the world. Existed in the entire world. So she was she was so much fun at the dog park. <laughs> And um, so we're hoping to get that gets a little easier yeah, in training her and walking her. But we had a good time. She she encourages us, and because we've had her now, we'll be more consistent on the walks. On that our we walks. Take. There we go. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about weight loss. Ooh. You want to do that? Okay. Here are some myths. Uh, the and there's a bunch. I doubt we'll get to all. Maybe okay. hit a few of weight loss myths. Here's let's here's see. a few. <laughs> some people say exercise enough. They tell us, however. Exercise is enough? Is enough. It's not okay. enough. 20% oh, no. is exercise. Really about 80% is diet. Wow. I would think that's about half and half. You've got to get out there and move. You do, but moving. But how many times have you really cut back on what you eat and all of a sudden you see a difference and a change? Oh, big, huge. When, right? when we started this, I did that and cut out all the sugars and sodas and carbs. Yeah. I have a friend who does training. And she's like, think of it this way, carbs stick to your belly. Mm. So think about that. It'll change the way you think about eating carbs. Here's another myth. Eating late at night is bad. Not always. Mm. It really depends on your uh, caloric intake. So if you're not getting enough calories, you need to eat. It, you need to eat. Yeah, otherwise, it, it wouldn't That's be good true, for you. That's true, because I get in the habit of eating late at night, and then I have to stop and say, are you hungry, or are you? is this a habit uh -huh. that you've made to snack late at night, or are you hungry? Have you not eaten? Right. And so for me, I know that if I do not eat, then I will wake up, and it's probably not a good thing the next sure. day because you're low. You're low for me, blood sugar, so, yeah. Okay. Now, let's get to another one. Here's another mm -hmm. one. Uh, limiting carbs leads to burning fat. It there is true that you will lose weight, but it is probably not fat that you're losing when you are <gasps> just going on a low-carb diet. Uh, what are you losing? What do you mean? Well, it says that you may actually be losing water at first. Uh, yeah. True. So you see lower numbers on the scales, but it's deceiving because you're actually shedding water initially. Which Bad makes sense day, to me because Ruth encouraged. and I did one of those diets, <laughs> and uh, you know what? My, I think back. my body thought that I was starving myself, or like I needed to hold on to it because I lost nothing. You lost that a little bit. Really? Who's going to do it for that long and lose two pounds? Okay. Nobody wants to do that. You want to see something on the scale. Here's another myth. You can be happier and healthy if you're thin. Which happier myth? and ha That's a myth? I guess you can be happy <laughs> any, any size? size of life. <laughs> if you had a big piece of cheesecake, you're even help, happier. No, I don't know. What do they say? What's that saying? That never trust a skinny cook or a skinny chef, right? Because they're happy making good food, right? Enjoying it. Yeah, and here was another one. That's, uh, here, here's another myth, and I'll stop at this one. There's many, many more, but one of them was that Ooh. spot reduction is possible. The idea that you can get a, a specific part of your body to look a a certain weight probably is doubtful. Oh my you goodness. Know, and isn't that true? Most, I need to lose some on the hips. I need to lose some on the tummy. I need to lose some on my face. I, usually you kind of start withering away at all points. Usually it's your extremities. Your extremities lose it first. So your it's like your, your arms, your hands. Your hands like, your, no, seriously. Is that true? Okay, you're never going to be like that insurance commercial. Have you seen that insurance commercial where the guy is... Uh, you know how you can pick your insurance and his 
calves are huge, oh, yeah. the bicycle rider. Right. You cannot do that, Brenton. Okay. So okay, now. that's out of the picture. You can't okay. do that. Well, I just thought those were some interesting <laughs> myths. I uh, always want to be like, if I could just hourglass. carve my body, if I could just carve it perfectly, yeah. it would be great. There would be certain areas not... I could carve off and other areas you could plump up, but you can't do that. No, that's not true. Here's one that I doubt very many people will hear about, but I, I think it is interesting. A French waiter was shot dead for making a sandwich too slowly, or at least the restaurant did. Goodness. He was the one who took the brunt of it. This was outside of Paris. He was a waiter? Uh-huh. He was shot at the restaurant when apparently the person thought that he had waited too long for his sandwich and killed him. They have not, had not, last I'd heard, caught this person. They, the folks were saying that they, in that area, that actually crime was going down. This was just a, a terrible event. Uh, no means it was no means a, a sign of a deeper problem. But one of the things that caught my attention is the fact that we are told, and this is not true, that gun violence is only pretty much a U.S. problem, and that mm. apparently is not the true case. And I think that's one of the reasons that maybe this doesn't fit the narrative that mm. is per presently being pushed. In. But always a tragedy when someone dies of any nature, but certainly so ridiculous mm -hmm. because you didn't get your food when you wanted it. Wow. wow. Terrible. Yeah. What else is out there in the news? Well, we have a news of a Colorado hunter surviving a mountain lion attack when he was doing everything right, they say, when he was attacked by the animal. Yes. He was scouting for elk around 9 p.m. at the Bighorn Park area, kind of close northwest to Denver. of Denver, on the 10th of August when a mountain lion attacked him. So he saw the mountain lion coming toward him. He began to back away slowly and then he tripped. Yeah. When he tripped and fell is when that mountain lion attacked him. Yeah. He was able to fight him off. He had a pocket knife and he stabbed him in the face. Ouchie. And so the mountain lion ran away. He was able to get away. They later did find the mountain lion. It was a young, young mountain lion. The nothing male. in his tummy. Right, nothing this in his grass. tummy. So he didn't attack, uh, hadn't attacked anything else. They figured he was probably just hungry, right? Yeah, kind of sad. That is. Um, they had bloodhounds, I think, that, mm -hmm. were, that were following him. He was him, aggressive. And he uh, yeah. tried to attack the hounds. And um, Nonetheless, it's, it's sad to see, a, well, sad to see a mountain lion go hungry, but it's, of course, much worse to see a mountain lion attack a person. Grateful that he knew what to do in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Would you know what to do? I mean, you know, how many of us think that we're going to run across a mountain lion? Well, you have to think. He had to get, take that pocket knife out, right? I'm sure he didn't have it out on him, so he had to take it out and think quickly. And not only that, he had to have a pocket knife with him mm -hmm. so that he was he had something available. Well, you know, here, here's one that I think is kind of a, or, or a thought that kind of hits me as, as you think about people going out and hunting and preparing to be in the outdoors, okay. is what have you done to prepare yourself for that event? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have, like here the people get lost, did you have enough water? Did you have a snack in your pocket? Did you have, did you have a, something like that? We, yeah. Ruth and I, we were in Rio Doso mm -hmm. at night, 10 o'clock at night, roughly, driving back to where we were staying. And we saw a black bear. And I, this black bear had to, it was a pretty good sized black bear. It was like above the knees running across the street. You remember that? He seemed larger what than that to me. What do you do? He seemed pretty tall. He did seem pretty big. What do you do? I mean, you think about, you talk about, oh, if I ever saw, really, what would you do? When I saw him, I was like, yeah, we're like, oh, Para is that, you're paralyzed. Is that a bear? See, did I just see what I is thought Is that a I big, saw? big bear? Right. What do I do now? Mm -hmm. And he disappeared into the, of course, in Rio Doso, there's a lot of woods to disappear into. Yeah. All it's right. kind of frightening. Well, here is another interesting thing that's being pushed right now. We're hearing about the potential of a recession in the future. And we're also now hearing that people are saying some are so opposed to us to our present leadership that they are pushing a narrative hoping that a recession would strike. That is a terrible thing. People suffer mm -hmm. immensely when the economy yes. contracts and a recession uh, costs people their jobs. I hope we never see another recession. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. But you know, I, I think it is a tragedy. That, and now people are beginning to talk about it in the news that some groups are really maybe even Pushing that narrative. Pushing a narrative of hoping for a recession. How sad is that? Yeah. Unbelievable. But think about it. They're pushing it to push a vote. Yep. To turn a vote, to change a vote, probably. Well, I most think. people historically vote their pocketbooks. And so if the economy is good, 
most people traditionally stick with the incumbents. Uh, but, well, of course, we're a long ways away from the election. We'll certainly see what happens. All right, we'll be back in a minute. We're getting down to about the last week that you can sign up for the golf tournament, oh second annual Alpha Omega Golf Tournament. And that is an exciting event coming up on August the 31st. Mm -hmm. Costs $80 to be able yes. to participate and includes a lot of goodies. Right. Green fees. Okay. Yes. Breakfast. Um, bre yeah, well, breakfast we are going to have a breakfast. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a lunch, a cart, and also range balls. And there are prizes. Yes, we have different prizes. I you don't know. You can hit a hole in one. Okay. A hole in one on one of them offers a $25,000 cash crass price. $25,000. I played that course recently. It is, would be a challenging hole to hit a hole in one. Not impossible, but for a golfer of my caliber, it would be pretty miraculous. <laughs> be sure to visit us um, for all the details on our website at kazq32.org. And thank you so much for your support. You guys are awesome. You support us throughout the year. Many of you are regulars at the sp sponsorship of Absolutely. Alpha Omega Broadcasting, and you are a blessing. Be sure to call us up if you have any questions, 505-884-8355, extension 101, or simply mail in your donation to 4501 Montgomery Boulevard, Northeast Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87109. KZQ is hosting its second annual golf tournament Saturday, August 31st at Los Altos Golf Course. There will be holding one prizes such as $25,000 prize on hole number 13, 50 inch HD LED TV, Callaway Irons 3 to a pitching wedge, and two round trip domestic airline tickets. Come out, play golf, eat lunch, and have a great time and maybe win some awesome prizes while supporting family programming. We have slots available for teams and individual golfers. Sponsor a hole such as a business or special memorial. Come out and have a great time. For more information, visit our website at www.kzq32.org or call us at today Camilla Feibelman who is the director of the Rio Grande Sierra Club. Camilla thank you for joining with us today. Well thanks for nice having to meet me. You. Good to have you. Well we're looking forward to learning a little bit about who you are and what you're involved with and I guess a good place for us to start <laughs> is to just say tell us a little bit about yourself and then yeah. if you can connect it to how you got involved with uh, the Sierra Club. Great. Well, I grew up here in Albuquerque, and every summer my mom would send me up to the Girl Scout camp, mm -hmm. and that was up in the Jemez Mountains, and it was just beautiful, and I think I knew that even as a little kid that it was something special, mm -hmm. and so that led me to want to figure out how I could care for creation and be part of protecting our air and water. Mm -hmm. So um, as I got older and was part of my, my environmental clubs, uh, the high school and doing recycling, I found the Sierra Club. And it was an organization that had been founded in 1892 by John Muir. Wow. Have you ever seen the California Quarter? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah, the one that's right for each state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's got Yosemite on it, and uh -huh. there's a tiny little man standing <laughs> on top of Half Dome. And so he was the founder of America's first environmental organization. And he would take these big groups of people out to explore the Sierras. Okay. And um, they would go for weeks at a time, and they'd bring all their food out on the on burrows and oh. set camp yeah. and, and just really enjoy the outdoors. This was in the, the 1890s? That they That's would do right. That. Wow. Wow. Formally, it was founded in 1892. And at first, they were real focused on getting outdoors. And that's something we continue to focus on today, connecting people with our natural beauty and okay. landscapes just to give us a sense of inspiration 
And um, so they eventually decided to also work to protect some of those resources. You know, as our cities were getting bigger and our demands for water, for example, were getting mm -hmm. bigger, um, they also decided to help try to protect clean air and clean water and make sure that all of those natural resources that are available okay. to us would be available for time and memorial for everybody um, to live in a healthy way. Wonderful. How long have you been with the Sierra Club? Oh, um, do I have to admit yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. So I've been with the Sierra Club for about 20 years, wow. but I've done all kinds of things. I helped lead our the student branch of our organization, okay. and I helped to found a chapter in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. that's been that's through great. some rough times mm -hmm. with big hurricanes lately, right. and now I'm back where I grew up here in New Mexico. Okay. Yeah, Tell awesome. us maybe <laughs> some of the biggest interests of people who are tied in in New Mexico to yes. the Sierra Club. You well, know, we really do yeah. have a lot of outdoor spaces and a lot of diversity mm -hmm. in New Mexico. That's right. It's a pretty large state. I think fifth or sixth largest geographically landmass state in the, in the country. So you, from the southern part of the state up to the northern part of the state, see a lot of topography changes. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. are people really into yeah. engaging in? Well, you know, that's actually a really good point. And for people who think you you need to have money to enjoy, mm -hmm. right? Right. Nature provides, you know, it just has all of this incredible scenery and um, really inspiration that we can all access for free. Mm -hmm. So starting in the southern part of the state, we've got the Oregon Mountains Desert mm -hmm. Peaks, which was recently designated as a national mm -hmm. monument. And that's and down by Las Cruces. That's down by Las Cruces, and actually it's a great road trip because you can go um, see White Sands, which is another mm -hmm. already declared monument. You can camp there. You can sled down the dunes. Um, and then you can go into Las Cruces and just do some easy urban hiking, or you can summit Picacho Peak. Um, okay. And one thing that we were talking about before going on the air is even here in Albuquerque and up and down our state along the Rio Grande, you've got the bosque. Mm -hmm. Everybody's heard of the bosque, right. but maybe doesn't realize that you can just go into the forest at any point where a road crosses the river at any of the four points where there's a bridge. Wow. And just and that's see. Specifically in Albuquerque. In right? Albuquerque, mm -hmm. and pretty much all up and down the river. I mean, it depends on the town, mm -hmm. but Albuquerque is really special because we are some of the only cities in the country that have protected that forested area along our rivers. And what it means is that you can be outside mm -hmm. in what we call nearby nature in five or 10 minutes awesome. of yeah, leaving your house. That's great. How can people get involved and make a difference? Yeah, well, one thing that you can do is come to our website, and that's Rio Grande Sierra Club, and you can see about all of our free outings. We offer outings in English and in Spanish. We offer outings for just anyone who wants to come, sometimes kids. We've got a okay. Military Families Outdoors program for veterans and their families. Oh, nice. You know, sometimes that's when you've nice. been in service, mm -hmm. there's a lot to deal with, and nature can be a very healing mm -hmm. way to come home, as we say. And so, you know, and that combines with the fact that our kids oftentimes these days have been in front of an electronic screen mm -hmm. in some form or another all day. True. And yes. if you're like us, yes. you probably got to play outside when you were right. a kid, unsupervised. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Yeah, that part unsupervised, that was good and bad, but it was <laughs> yeah. true, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you now. know, some of the bad also probably taught you some lessons no, that were did. important yeah. for life. Yeah. And it's very calming, like you said, and very healing. It's, 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 uh, it makes a difference when you have had a busy day and just put your phone down, get outside and take a walk, disconnect sure. from yeah. everything. That's right. It really does do well for you. Yeah, John Muir said that we need places to pray in and we need places to play in. And that a lot of times those are two things that go together. Um, I think nature can be very consoling for people. Mm -hmm. If you're in a hard moment, just watching water and listening to uh -huh. it go by or watching the sunset. Um, and even more practically, they say that people who live within a 10 minute walk of a park are happier. Wow. Well, good for me. I live within a 10 minute walk of a park, so. You should be very yeah. happy. Albuquerque is pretty good in that way. We, we have great parks, that's for sure. You know, uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. was how do people, parents, grandparents, yeah. engage in getting kids mm -hmm. uh, outside? Because, yeah. you know, that has changed. When I was a little, little boy, mm -hmm. yep. it, like you said, Camilla, you could go outside, ride your bicycle. It wasn't uh, uncommon to not be called in until the yeah. sun was going down. 
um, or for dinner, mm -hmm. one of those things. But anymore, you are not, you just never see children mm -hmm. outside yeah. without an adult. And if, and if that limits how much time they get to be outside because parents can't just sit outside all the yeah, time right. and just watch them go up and down the street. Exactly. Well, there are a few things you can do. First, and this is something we've done in our family, is to make our backyard just totally safe. Um, there's no okay. place you get out, um, mm -hmm. but the door is always open, and the kids know that they can be out there, they can play by themselves, and we've created a safe environment for okay. them. Okay, that's mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, and then also we try after school once a week just to go someplace outside. It could be the park next to our house. It could be to the foothills in the Sandias. Mm -hmm. It could be in the Bosque. That's one way to do it. And then one thing that I recommend when you go outdoors, adults are very linear. You know, we want to start, we want to get to the end, uh -huh. we want to come back. But kids really aren't like that. And so one thing I would recommend is just go to an outdoor space, but don't have any objective in mind. Let the kids lead the way. Um, don't try to redirect their attention. Just let them do what they want to do, and you'll be amazed at what they discover, whether mm -hmm. it's a little insect or a body of water. Um, but just allow them to be and discover. And um, I also recommend doing it among multiple families. You know, if, um, if you can take a couple of families, maybe even neighborhood families, so that there is kind of a tradition of getting outdoors together. Um, but you do these days have to plan it. And mm -hmm. some doctors are actually prescribing getting outdoors. Yeah. Um, is that right? Because the kids need the movement. We need to be learning about our environment. And, you know, especially for those of you who are in education, there are some people who say, you know, attention deficit disorder is actually nature deficit disorder. Oh, wow. Very kids need to be in motion. Mm -hmm. They need to be learning about their environment. And when kids are outdoors, they've found that even their science and math grades go up okay. because their brains are learning how to solve problems and learning about the natural environment. Wow, I really love that. And I and like you said, planning is important because yeah. maybe, you have, maybe you're a single parent and like for me, I'd be like, I'm afraid to go out alone with just my child yeah. for safety reasons. So if you plan to go with other people, that's... And that's what we offer. We even have a program called the Bosquitos. Okay. And so this is that's meant, so cute. right? This, so this is meant to help parents and kids get outside, and that's why we offer our volunteer-led excursions to nature because we know people maybe have gotten a little disconnected mm -hmm. even from what's available in their right. own town, mm -hmm. and so um, you know, finding those opportunities or even going as a group if you're part of a congregation, if you're part of a neighborhood association, um, suggesting that as an activity, finding somebody who can maybe lead that excursion for you or it could just be a picnic it could just be getting together um, you know at a natural place everybody bringing food and hanging out together and just seeing what it's like yeah. Camilla you really encouraged us to, to get outdoors and I really appreciate your mm -hmm. emphasis on that today she's the director of the Rio Grande Sierra Club so I appreciate you being with us thank, thank you, you. Very nice Today we're going to go to the book of Job, first chapter. Let's pick up the reading in verse number one. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their mm -hmm. hearts. This was Job's regular practice. That's amazing. As, as we touched on that, you touched on that uh, over the weekend in, in the message that you brought 
one of the things that struck me was when the celebrations ended. So the sons are hosting a celebration. The brothers are there. There are seven brothers, mm -hmm. three sisters. They include their sisters in the celebration. When the celebrations ended, sometimes several days later. Wow. So this is a long party, a lot of partying, but a very expensive party. It's not something many sure. of us, when we have family over, Christmas or Christmas Eve, you expect them, they're going to be here from this time to this time, and then I have, we have tomorrow to ourselves. But this was going to be costly, and they're going to, they were doing it for several days. He would purify his children. He would get up the next day and say, maybe, perhaps they've done something. Perhaps they've cursed God. They've sinned in some way. He was interceding for his family, which reminds us many times when our children grow up, I've heard parents say, well, for my child's 18th birthday, I bought him a set of luggage. <laughs> Tells them, you know, you're an adult. You're out of here. You're on your own now. But you know what? It's important for us to continue to pray for our children, continue to intercede for our children. It really does make a difference, which in this whole thing, that's one of the things that came to me was like, you yes. know what? I need to do a better job myself of continuing to intercede for my children. It doesn't matter how old they are. How, we always think of how young they are. But when they grow up and they're making decisions on their own, all the more for us to pray for our children, intercede for our kids. And, and he said, perhaps my children have sinned mm -hmm. and have cursed God in their hearts. In their hearts. You know, he, he realizes that they're involved in a, a time of festivities. And he says, you know, I wonder if they've gotten themselves in trouble. trouble. I wonder if they haven't been thankful. I wonder if they've cursed God. Yeah. Wow, you know, it's important for us to pray for our children. Every person has to make their own decision. Right. I don't diminish that. Right. But your prayer is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I hope that you will intercede for people today and understand that your prayers really do matter and what your example that you're setting for your children mm -hmm. really does have lasting impact. Thanks for being with us on Spectrum. Until next time, have a blessed day.